In Australian sporting culture, there is that ultimate driving desire to compete on the world stage and to test ourselves and to prove ourselves. So for Black Caviar, she was unbeatable on home soil and there was the lure to go and test that against the world. I think that her reputation uh, preceded her uh, in a much bigger way than the other sprinters who came over. People were sitting up and taking notice. We thought that she was the best horse in the world, race sprinter in the world. Royal Ascot was the ultimate theatre. The fact that it is the Queen's meeting that was so rich and so enticing and absolutely irresistible. Royal Ascot is something special for all of us and we just wanted to go. I wanted to train a winner, Peter Moody. You know, uh, Royal Ascot winner. You, if I ever go back there, it'll say Peter G. Moody won. <laughs> that's one more than a lot of people have got. So that's why I wanted to be there. Black Caviar, the day before she leaves, is marched out in front of the stable, essentially in spandex. She's in a black compression suit, the likes of which we've never seen on a thoroughbred before. I think it was 30, 31 hours stable to stable and she's standing up that whole time and at the time a lot of sports medicine sort of guys would start to come out and you'd see athletes and footballers travel in these skins which ultimately was about creating blood flow so we thought well why not for a horse. It's called sexy, it's called racy, it's almost ludicrous. There are cartoons drawn the next morning. It's the subject of serious talkback radio across the nation. It becomes a magnetic moment that I think does have the parallels to the old boy being hoisted up on the pulley and put on the steamship. Behind the secure gates at Abington Place, Peter Moody fears that black caviar is coming apart. She's being treated from everything from a grumbly suspensory to a torn ligament which she sustained in the last run in Adelaide. And she's got bad feet. It's fraught. She has a gallop at Newmarket on the Tuesday before the race. Luke rode her in that gallop and uh, did a little bit more than we wanted. He just wanted to make sure he ticked her off before she went to the races that she was going to carry us through one more time, but that was it, that was the last one. That was, that was the only gallop she had in it. For a filly that was tinkering on going over the top uh, at the end of the back end of the preparation, she certainly didn't need that and, and didn't aid a cause. He tells the owners on the Tuesday night that any thought that this is more than a one-run campaign is off. I just pulled them aside and I said, Look, you know, listen, the mare's not in as good a shape as I would like. We had to sort of keep this very positive persona because everyone was there and, and we didn't want to feel we were letting, letting anyone down. But I didn't want them planning beyond Saturday because I knew if I got her to Saturday there was never going to be another run because I was struggling to get her there for that race. Once Peter said that, we there, there was no argument. It took the wind out of a few of our sails, but at the same time, Peter said that uh, he saw no issue about uh, coming up, but he, he didn't want to push her on any further than uh, the Golden Jubilee. We all said, that's all we want to win. Moody's last press appearance, he keeps her under wraps, and he doesn't remove the compression suit, the black caviar. And he's been asked about what she might be capable of, and his line is, a quarter of an inch will do. He just wants her to win. And then Moody has the decision to make on the Saturday morning, does he take her to the races or not? It wasn't until about 2.30 Saturday morning that I'd really made the definitive decision that she was going to run. I was tinkering on the thought that, you know, this filly isn't going to be able to win this race, do I want to risk that? I always said to Luke, when you take her to the start, if you feel something's not right or, or she's not quite 100%, you just put, jump off her and pull the saddle off, you know? It was probably the worst thing I ever did to him because he, I think he basically said, you, you're putting that pressure on me. We were shocked by how many Australians had descended upon London. People who had taken extraordinary routes to make sure that they were part of it. So many people had their salmon and black dot ties. And you know who's, who's up there looking down on you, who's got her position yep. in the special box to see your filly. She was very interested in, in the horse and the strain racing. She's very knowledgeable on her horse racing, as everyone knows. And we, she was very keen for Black Caviar to win. 
so much media attention on this horse, particularly in Australia and indeed in America. CNN were covering her and in the Middle East. They even moved an Aussie rules match, football match, because of black caviar. They didn't want to clash. Back in Melbourne in the middle of the night, a couple of thousand people had been drawn to Federation Square. The amount of people that went there it uh, was at one o'clock in the morning. He certainly had a good fan club. Colin Madden, one of the owners, we always had this little thing where I used to twirl a dollar coin between my fingers when we watched a race and he always made sure I had a dollar coin to play with. <laughs> but uh, it was probably more about cigarettes than anything. <laughs> uh, the nervousness of, of watching it and, uh, and knowing she wasn't right, um, you know, that, that was the hard part. Society rough began badly. Soul is going to be the early leader. Things looked relatively smooth through the formation stages of the race. And on the near side, you've got Black Caviar in third. Absolutely perfect. As a, a Black Caviar fan, you could not be more happy. But Luke Nolan has felt it on the way down that she's not in the manner that she usually is. She didn't travel in a normal manner, which is very strong on the bridle. When she's racing on the straight course at home, she didn't she didn't give me that feel. You know, she never really trucked up under him. They've just gone past the half mile there. You know, she's about two and a half lengths off the lead. But once again, she's still only just travelling. She didn't drag me to where I need to go. That was the thing. Like she used to do my job for me, more or less. She could absorb pressure and she'd kick. I fed her a bit of rain and she was at her top and we're a fair way from home. Um, and that's not like her at all. And I knew it was going to be heart and mouth stuff uh, from that point on. Now Nolan starts to shake the reins at Black Caviar. She starts to move up on the near side. Black Caviar finds the margin, but it's hard work. I think, well, absolutely home for all money. And then right at the end. But it's Black Caviar in front with 100 yards left to go. Here's Restia Dajon and Moonlight Cloud. He eases up near the line. Here's Moonlight Cloud. It's tight. Black Caviar and Moonlight Cloud in a photo. And there's this gasp. It was just bedlam because people were going everywhere and no one around us knew who won. The gut feeling at the time was that she just got there, but I did want to see uh, the, the shutter cam uh, as they crossed the line because Moonlight Cloud was absolutely flying. It was nerve wracking, don't worry about that. Well, I knew I'd done enough to last, but um, there weren't many people um, sharing my confidence and they were some of them were standing right on the lines. Peter Moody, he will not be a happy man. What should have been a moment of pure triumph and exhilaration becomes a bit more complicated than that. There's almost an atmosphere that would accompany her getting beaten. She won. She's completed the mission. They're waving the flags at Federation Square, but it's just not, it's confusing. Well, I reckon that's about the third time I watched that in 10 years. <laughs> Luke Nolan's place in this is so vexed, and I feel desperately for him because this is, this is the climax of his career as well. Every jockey dreams of this horse, of this partnership. Luke had a great affinity with Black Caviar. You know, uh, he, he loved her more than anyone and used to ease her down and look after her and cuddle her in her races. And, uh, you know, he never wanted to see her get knocked around either. Always looked after her, always looked after her. That was, it was always first and foremost. And it was whether it was on the training track or at the races, always, always looking after her. And, she was big, but she was fragile, and you had to look after her, otherwise she wasn't going to get to the races every, every, as many times as she did. When he watches that again on replay, he will have his heart in his mouth. He won't sleep for a week. Peter Moody had said he didn't mind if he only won by half an inch, but I, I thought he was joking. <laughs> Maybe Luke Nolan took him at his word. I got a little bit too confident, and there's a lot of relief that the photograph went that way, because the rest of his life would have been uh, not very nice. It's quite unfortunate, because it's going to overshadow what was a very good win. They're going to talk about more about my brain fade than uh, the horse's fantastic effort. And I thought I'd just get out in front of it. If I put my hands up, hopefully that'll be the end of it, and I'll just move on. And it wasn't quite the end of it, but I, I absolved myself of it. Are you going to be able to enjoy this eventually? Oh, look, I will, look. Should be won. I wouldn't have looked at that 10 years ago, so that's changed a bit, I suppose, yes. Yeah. It is what it is, it is what it is. It, I should be up and about, and my, my wife, she tells me that all the time. She said, but you still bloody won. And I said, yes, I did win, but 
it still it comes back to what if. I think he has nightmares about what might have been, but it didn't happen. And I keep saying to him, you won, mate, you won. We wanted to have a stubby and relax, but people were always going to want to narrow in on Luke's ride. And even to this day, I hear people say, you know, bloody hell, what's going on? But, um, you know, she won. She, she got the job done. It wasn't his doing, it was just the horse was worn out and it was probably my mistakes by giving her too big a preparation before she went there, really. The one moment after the race which did sort of hit the markers and is so, for the sentimental, for the misty-eyed, is Black Caviar poses with the photo with the ownership group and as she's not settled, they don't keep her there for very long. Peter Moody leads Black Caviar around and the Queen is there. And long-time Ascot observers can't remember this before, but the Queen wanted to pat Black Caviar. We're just sort of wandering around and we were very concerned about her, you know, like she had the wobbles up, she was having a big pant and sort of had her heads down, we are having a yarn sort of just across the front of her and all of a sudden we were stopped. The crowd sort of came in and in and in and all of a sudden here's this lovely lady standing in front of us, the Queen. Paddy and his little dry Kiwi drool, he's a New Zealander, he looked up and he said, you want to give her a pat? And I thought, hmm, it's probably not, <laughs> not the way you dress the Queen, but she put her hand out and uh, placed her hand on her nose and uh, it's pretty special. Here's the Queen, um, you know, coming down to dote on my horse. In the presentation, you know, she was asking us quickly where we were from, how we were feeling, but then it was about the horse. <laughs> she wanted to know more about our girl. Black Caviar captured the hearts of everyone from the hard-bitten punter at the TAB through to people who didn't care much for racing through to the Queen of England. For her athletic ability and for her speed and for all her winning, there was this something that just grabbed all of us. She showed courage in, in, in spades that day. Like the tips were down. She was, she was out on her feet. She was at the end of a long preparation. She was injured during a run and she's still bloody on the race. She's not only fast, but she's very, very tough. Look, in my, my lifetime, you know, Black Caviar has been the pinnacle, apart from having kids, I suppose, but <laughs> to go through her and win 15 Group 1s, win at Royal Ascot, um, was something you'll never forget. She went outside the bubble. She travelled two-thirds the way around the world, took on all comers, and unfortunately, she's not recognised for that, probably, you know? The people miss that because on that occasion, she just fell in. She brought class and she brought courage to Royal Ascot, so I think she's left a great legacy. Black Caviar's gift to racing, to Australian racing, to world racing, is to make perfection permanent. 25 runs, 15 group ones, started favourite every time, won them all. That's, that's her unique characteristic, and that will always be her special 